right, so we're riding the waves. Thank you uh, very much for coming back. And on behalf of Mario Jose and the whole team at Vest, uh, welcome to Vest Den Haag, where we are in our second day of our uh, Spinoza extravaganza here, uh, Spinoza Passionate Reason. We've uh, gone through, uh, for those who have not been here, I wanted to uh, quickly introduce from uh, left to right uh, our panel, who, you, who will be responding directly after the talk by Andrea San Giacomo. Uh, so from left to right, uh, from uh, the University of Stockholm, Torkel Tanem, from uh, the, <laughs> there he, um, sorry, I forgot now, the uh, University of Sydney, uh, Dr. Moira Gat Gatins, I heard yesterday, it's Gatins, yes, Dr. Moira Gatins, yeah, from the gay. gay, Gatins, okay. Um, <laughs> from the Merz uh, Academy in Stuttgart, uh, Dr. Katja Diefenbach, from uh, the University of Dundee, uh, Aberdeen. Aberdeen. <laughs> <laughs> Next door, okay. Uh, Dr. Beth Lord, and from the CNRS and from Oxford University, uh, Dr. Uh, Moin Lerke. Uh, so I'm very uh, pleased to introduce to you uh, Dr. Andrea San Giacomo from the, uh, as you can see, the Royal University of Groningen. Uh, he's also uh, the director of a summer school, a Spinoza summer school, which happens every two years in Groningen. Uh, and uh, it happened this year, so it will happen in two years uh, from now. And uh, he's also the uh, editor, you're not the translator though, of this multilingual, also translator, also translator of uh, complete works of Spinoza. Uh, in which languages? It's multilingual. Uh, well, original languages and Italian. Translations to Italian. Oh, tra translations from all the original languages to Italian. So please, a warm welcome to Andrea San Giacomo. So thanks Baruch, thanks Maria Jose, and thanks everybody for being here. And it's, I have to say it's a very nice uh, gathering this one and I'm enjoying it very much both for uh, the quality of the discussion we have had and also for this kind of more non-academic setting which I'm enjoying very much, it's very refreshing, so thanks for putting that together. And after a very intense first day, I'm now realizing that my talk would be kind of ref reflection on some of the issues that we covered also yesterday, and maybe there will be a few suggestions to move the discussion in a certain directions. So uh, what I will uh, talk about today is, uh, well, oppressive societies and how this problem can be addressed using some of Spinoza's machinery and some of Spinoza's toolkit that he develops in his uh, metaphysical, ethical, political philosophy. So, of course, Spinoza was well acquainted with this problem, and I'll try to convince you that indeed he was so acquainted that at some point uh, he changed his mind about how to go about it. And I would say this was Spinoza's problem, full stop. So this is just to boost it a bit, the, the topic, but let's see whether you buy into this narrative. So for today, the plan is usual, boring, straightforward plan. Let I start with presenting fundamental moral dilemma, which I think goes beyond Spinoza. It's a moral dilemma we all face, and philosophers all face, and every human being has to face at some point. And then I'll introduce some background that I will use later. And it's mostly based on a consideration of Spinoza's whole corpus from the very early writings to the la later uh, political treatise, which is kind of the bulk of a book that I put together over the last six years and is now coming up. So uh, to some extent, I will be summarizing points that have been addressed there. I'll try to remain a bit uh, at kind of grand level, so general level, not getting too much into the technicalities of the argument. If you want to hear more, of course, we can talk about details in the Q&A. And then I'll introduce properly the problem of oppressive societies and why this is such a crucial problem for Spinoza's ethical theory, and then try to suggest how to move towards a solution using some of the resources that Spinoza develops. And 
I'll have some conclusions. Some of them directly connected with the talk, some of them not connected with the talk, and kind of aside, you'll see. Um, so, about the fundamental moral dilemma. So this is the question, right? So how can we reach the supreme good? And the real dilemma here is not what the supreme good is. We all know it, right? So knowing what the supreme good is, it's pretty easy. Come on, supreme good, knowledge. I mean, we, we, all, know, we all know what we should be doing, right? So that's not difficult to know. The problem is how we do that. And this is something that we discussed yesterday in different, uh, under different facets, because of course we know that we should be rational, but how do we become rational, right? So for Spinoza, it's uncontroversial that the supreme good is knowledge, adequate knowledge of the idea of God, right? That's the supreme good. Enjoying that knowledge is the supreme good. He repeats that from the first lines of the treatise on the mandation of the intellect, first work, and he suggests that till the political treatise and the later correspondence. So he never changed his mind about that. But I think what's really interesting about Spinoza is that that taken for granted, that we know what we should aim at, it becomes very interesting to see why it's so difficult to get there. And so one possible answer is how do we get to the supreme good? Well, I can go to the supreme good. I can get the supreme good. So it's kind of individualistic solution. I would call it self-sufficiency. Like there is something in the nature of a subject that allows that subject to reach the supreme good. So this is one option, right? Maybe I don't know about the others, but I can get it. Alternative answer is we can do that, right? This is a more social answer. So maybe the individualistic approach doesn't work, but we all together will get to the supreme good. And that's more of kind of, let me call it social optimism. Like we as a collective body, we can move toward the good. Now, the problem is that I'll try to show or suggest that none of these answers work. And Spinoza was very well aware of that. That's exactly Spinoza's problem. And both have problems. So the problem that is immediately faced by those who claim we can make it is exactly the problem of oppressive societies. And at a very general level, the problem is the following. So most of the time, the we is a deluded we. Is a we formed by craving, oppression, power struggle, all ingredients that if they do something, they prevent knowledge from arising. And oppressive society are like, they survive and thrive by repressing knowledge, by discarding knowledge, by hindering knowledge. So if we have to make it, then we have to face this problem. And the problem that answer one, the more self-sufficiency answer faces is that, of course, there are no atomic individuals, right? So if we want to go for that kind of self-sufficiency, it's very difficult to see how that can work. Now, this is in general. And I think I have a kind of story narrative, maybe narrative in more sense, about uh, what Spinoza, how Spinoza dealt with these problems. And I think Spinoza was so well aware about oppression, and if you look at his life, I mean, it's uncontroversial that he was aware, right? That he tried at the beginning to avoid the problem. And that's the reason why I would suggest, and I won't get into the details now, that in his early writings, he is a super strong defender of what I would call the epistemic self-sufficiency of the mind. He endorses a form of inatism according to which the mind, by its very nature, has an innate, adequate idea of God that it can reach immediately as soon as it gets rid of obscure and inadequate ideas. Everything is already in the mind. You don't need to bother about society. You can reach the supreme good just reflecting on your own mind. This is the uh, task that Spinoza tries to develop 
in the treatise on the emendation of the intellect and in the short treatise. And this, I would suggest, is, is so strong. If, if you read the text from this point of view, you see that Spinoza goes really for something extremely strong. And why? Well, my suggestion is that because he's so aware that society may be a threat that you need really to find an alternative to that. Now, the problem is that the solution doesn't work. And at some point, been, I think that the correspondence with Willem van Blyenberg has been already mentioned. And around that correspondence, one way of reading that correspondence is seeing also Spinoza struggling with himself because van Blyenberg pushes against Spinoza the problem as we discussed yesterday morning. I mean, but if God reveals himself to the prophets, to Adam, how is it that possible that they completely fail to understand that? And Spinoza in one of his letters maintains that God provides us an uncorrupted intellect, right? So if the claim is that I have a true adequate idea of God in me and all that I need to do is just to attend to that, then how that happens that human beings for the most part fail to see that idea. Even people that are on the payroll of a university to think about God, theologians, I mean, there is a whole faculty, a whole bunch of people, their job is just to think about God, and they're all wrong. And Spinoza know that. At some point, you must have realized that there is something that doesn't work, not because there is an internal logical inconsistency of the idea that there is this epistemic self-sufficiency from a logical point of view is all coherent. It's just a huge explanatory failure concerning how human beings actually are, so how they behave in reality, right? And I think because he was confronted with this problem, which has to do with superstition, Spinoza at some point realizes that, okay, the true supreme good is not knowing God, okay, but there must be something more on top of what we have as in innate tools that we can develop. And that's the reason why he tries to articulate something we could call an answer tree. So something that has to do with fostering social cooperation, but with an important qualification. So we need to foster a certain kind of social cooperation, which I would suggest as a requirement has to foster agreement in nature, convenire in natura, rather and minimize disagreement in nature. And the rest of the talk will be a kind of unpacking of this claim. So again, Spinoza, I would say in, in the later writings, after TTP, Theological Political Treatise, he goes on to try to understand in under which conditions society can really be beneficial, right? So this is the very general picture. Let me get into a bit more details. So just to sketch the general story uh, and the background of that, so as I already mentioned, I do have a kind of story to tell about Spinoza's early writings and this idea of the epistemic self-sufficiency, why this doesn't work, and why at that stage Spinoza thinks that social factors uh, have only this kind of tuning role so they can be beneficial if they are there, but if they are not there, you're fine, you, you'll survive anyway. So the real turning point in Spinoza's career is the TTP, which I take to be a case study on actual the, on, on the real phenomenon of religion superstition that you can understand, of course, it has many facets, it has political dimensions, theological dimensions, but it has also kind of experiment in moral anthropology and see how does superstition work? What are the passions involved in superstition? How do they hinder or foster certain kinds of cooperation among individuals? And for instance, it's very interesting to see how Spinoza analyzes the role of ambiguous passions in the TTP, because certain passions are always bad, certain passions tend to be good, certain passions can, passions can help make a switch. Example, wonder. So wonder can be an element in superstition, but can also be used together with love for God to foster devotion, and devotion fosters obedience to certain moral rules, which in turn foster a kind of more rational cooperation. And Spinoza does this in a kind of very empirical way, just going to the scripture and seeing what was discussed there and trying to reconstruct the kind of moral psychology that was going on there. So that's why I think the TTP is a real turning point in his philosophical career. And then, so the idea is that some combinations of passion, some, may have an instrumental role 
in fostering rationality. And here Spinoza's view is still a bit fuzzy, but it, it's like, well, we all have this innate tendency to develop intellect and mastering the passions, but in order to be able to do that, we need the right, right conditions in place around us. And these right conditions are society, a certain kind of society. And it doesn't go into the details, in the theoretical details behind this view, but the intuition seems to be there in place. And the other more like theoretical shift that takes place is that this view requires, requires that passions are no longer just a cognitive affair. In the early writings, passions are just cognitive affair, or just inadequate ideas. The body doesn't play any role there. For the social setting to play a role and to, be, to impact on the passions, of course, you need to acknowledge that passions do have a powerful bodily root, right? And you need to address that as well. Okay, so the most important point that I think emerges from the ethics is, is this uh, kind of not very prominent at, at the first reading, but still very prominent if you try to analyze the details, aspect of the ethics, which is the notion of agreement in nature. And this is basically a very, very short summary of what I will use in the rest of the talk, is the idea that you can use the notion of agreement in nature to understand the difference between activity and passivity. And basically, I will suggest that when we are active, it's because not we are acting in isolation from other causes, but because we act in agreement with other causes, and therefore, insofar we agree with others, whatever we produce is something that is shared with the other thing. So it doesn't matter who is actually producing the thing, that effect can be adequately conceived on the basis of the nature of both of us or each of us. And, and uh, passivity can be understood in terms of disagreement in nature. And the other important point is that passivity and activity comes in degrees, and they coexist in every causal interaction. So the, the picture here is that when we interact, like me giving now this talk to you, so at, in this very operation, there is, there is a certain degree of activity, and there is a certain degree of passivity. And they are all always co-present. There has to be a minimal degree of agreement in nature and therefore of activity in every causal interaction be because with zero agreement, there would be completely different things that do not share anything, even an attribute. And without sharing even an attribute, there is no causal interaction in the first place. So there has to be some form of agreement. And of course, in this case, we agree on many more than just sharing the attributes of thought or extension. We also kind of human beings, whatever this means, right? And of course, there are also degrees of disagreement. And the key point is, how do we use these different degrees, right? So many cases, we just follow what external causes suggest, and this often turns out to foster disagreement. But we can also, under certain circumstances, build on the agreement that is already entailed. And by building on that agreement, switch the relationship and cultivate agreement over disagreement. And I'll try to illustrate how this is supposed to work. And indeed, my reading of the political treatise is that the political treatise is the sixth part of the ethics, and to put it a bit provocatively, and I would say that this notion of agreement and disagreement, the use of the passions, is exactly what Spinoza is implementing in the political settings. And he does that because he realizes that the project of the ethics cannot be achieved in just isolation. It has to be a social political project. And therefore, it's good for Spinoza to apply that theme, that, that theory, to political settings. And so I won't get into the details of what Spinoza says in the uh, political treatise. I'll just try to extrapolate from uh, some things he says in the ethics and also there a possible solution to the general problem of oppressive societies. So let me rephrase the problem now in more Spinozistic terms, so connected with what I said so far. So the conceptual problem is more or less like this. So the supreme good requires reason. So we know that. Let's like, take that for granted. Now, reason requires agreement in nature. So in order to reason, 
we need to agree in nature with other things. And this is on the basis of that agreement that we can develop common notions, and common notions are the foundations of our reasonings. Quote from Ethic 2, Proposition 4, this column 2. Now, in order to agree in nature, we need a society that is not oppressive. That means that if we are already in an oppressive society, that oppressive society is ruled mostly by disagreement in nature. So the problem is that when we say that reason, supreme good, depends on agreement, depends on external causes, that makes their achievement very much dependent on external causes. And that makes the, the quality of the social life we have extremely relevant, indeed a necessary condition for developing reason and hence achieve the supreme good. But if the society has, has to be non-oppressive, then the real problem is how do we transition from a society which is oppressive to a society that is not oppressive. So the problem becomes that of the transitioning between the lower degrees of agreement to higher degrees of agreement. Because of course, if society would be by definition non-oppressive, then there would be no problem. But this is exactly the kind of experiential fact that, that is not in place. Right? We experience society very often as oppressive at some level. So this is the general problem. And the problem becomes, how do we move, right? How do we, do we move toward the supreme good without assuming since the beginning that we are already there? Because another way of thinking about the self-sufficiency that I mentioned at the beginning is that we are already there. We already have the supreme good. We don't need to do much. No? Everything is already fine. Now, if you don't assume that, the problem becomes, okay, things are not fine as they are. How do, how do we make them fine? What is needed for that? And so, the, there is some scholarly debate. I'll go quick about this because uh, we can discuss this more maybe in, in the debate. But there are a few solutions that have been advanced. So one has to do with the way in which passions can integrate reason. And the idea is that reason is very general, and then we use passion to like particularize uh, our reasoning. So we integrate passions as an element that gives us access to the individuals, to the details, and then allows us to implement very general rules. Now, the problem with this reading, and I'll be very quick here, is that, oh, first of all, for Spinoza, reason is not just universal. I'll have to say something more about that. And second of all, passions are not epistemically reliable. So there is no way you can use a passion to adequately understand something because you have a passion exactly because you don't have adequate ideas. Otherwise, you wouldn't have a passion in the first place. At least, this is Spinoza's theory. So if you want to remain within that theory, you can't use passions for epistemic, uh, as epistemic tools that are reliable. So the other solution is to say, well, communications and sharing of ideas within a society will make the trick, right? And in a sense, yes, but only if the society is already non-oppressive. Because the first thing that this oppressive society will do is to prevent exactly that free sharing of ideas and communication. That's exactly what an oppressive society does. So it doesn't seem that this kind of idea where you insist on the importance of just freedom of speech and philosophizing is what can help to do the transitioning. Because when you start in an oppressive society, that's exactly what's prevented. That's what's exactly what's not available, to some extent at least. And so the other possible solution, which is a bit general, is to use passions to sustain and support cooperation, which of course is very true, good, and sounds very nice. But again, if the society is already decently ra rational, then why bother? It's already decently rational. You don't, yeah, you can use some passion sometimes, but it's not really a huge problem. The problem is that if you have an oppressive society, that's exactly a society in which passions are not used to sustain and support cooperation, but are used to sustain and support exploitation. So that's exactly why. So my general concern with the way in which this problem is addressed in some scholarship is that that scholarship seems to be overly optimist about the quality of society, and this, therefore does not address the problem of how we get to a decently organized society. 
and they think we need to address this problem because even if today our society is decent enough, we don't know what will happen tomorrow. We learned that yesterday, right? So, um, let me introduce to give you a solution, or at least sketch a solu possible solution, few ideas we can use. So the first comes from the second part of the ethics, and it's something that, of course, in some scholarship, especially French scholarship, is very much appreciated. Anglophone scholarship sometimes tends to gloss over this, and is the distinction between proper and universal common notions. So, and this is important because Spinoza's account of reason does not present reason as only knowledge of the most universal features of the world. Of course, this is something there. These are called universal common notions, like the notion of extension, the notion that everything is extended will be either in motion or at rest. But Spinoza also introduces this notion of proper common properties, which picked peculiar features shared by certain group of things. For instance, we all bodies, so we all share the fact that we have a mass, so if we jump out of the window, we we'll all fall down. If you don't believe me, just try. <laughs> Not now, in the break. So, but we are also human beings, which means we can philosophize. Stones do share the same properties of falling down, but to my knowledge, they don't philosophize. Of course, this may be proven to be wrong in the future, but so far, let's assume that stones don't philosophize. Why? Because that's not something that they share. They don't have that kind of interaction possible to them. And of course, we can make that more refined. But of course, one obvious thing, one obvious example of common properties is what you share as citizen of a certain state. In virtue of being citizen of a certain state, you can make certain things, you can produce certain effects that you could not produce in another state. Think about contracts, think about all, all what we create at the social level. And I'm using this example exactly to, to point out that proper common notions are crucial, not just for epistemology, but also for, for political theory. Because they can be tailored to different groups, and there is no bottom line to which they can reach. And a second element I'd like to introduce is taken from the way in which Spinoza suggests in the fifth part of the ethics how to deal with passions. And of course, there are many different readings of what he suggests, and it's very controversial. I'll just present you with my reading, and then we can discuss it. But my reading is that every interaction entails both activity and passivity. And therefore, Spinoza's suggestion is that when we undergo a passion, we are also undergoing some action somewhere. So the point that we should really put effort on is to exploit that degree of activity, how minimal it is, and build on that to flip the relationship between activity and passivity. So when I'm very angry at my neighbor because she cut down my tree, and I really love that tree, right? So I got really mad at her because she did something I really dislike. But then, if I also realize that I'm interacting with my neighbor, and we share the fact that we're human, we've been living next to each other for a long time, we always had some kind of good relationships, I'm also affected by the idea of her being my neighbor. So, and that's there. It's just clouded by the hatred produced by that interaction on the spot. Now, depending on circumstances, depending on causes and conditions that are acting in the moment, either the passivity, hatred, or the activity can prevail. I can immediately realize, oh, but she's my good friend, so I shouldn't get angry at, that, at her. And hatred is not going to help me anyway, right? Because I, I still be living here, so what's the point of having an enemy just next to me, right? And that flips immediately the relationship, right? So this is in general. Let's now try to implement this. So the scenario, I'll present you first with a general scenario for oppressive society understood from a Spinozistic point of view, and then I'll try to flesh out that with some elements derived from the TTP. It's a bit of a kind of theoretical reconstruction of what Spinoza could say, but uh, let's see how it goes. So an oppressive society entails, I think, three main ingredients. First, you have a dominant leader or dominant leaders that use power to enforce their own preferences and upon others. And they have enough power 
to be successful in this. And this is mostly driven by the passions of glory and ambition. And this is something that Spinoza comments on very often. So these two passions are very, very important. And indeed, this is the reason why both passions has to be addressed in political theory. And he does that in the political treatise, but that not for, for now. Now, if the leaders are su successful, then there will be a group of people which will just follow them and will just accept to follow their preferences, partly by imitation of affects and part toward the leader and toward each other. And of course, you can put more nuances here, more passions coming into play, but this is a very general scheme, right? This is the dominant group. Now, the point is, Spinoza demonstrates that passions can never produce 100% agreement within a certain group because passions, by definitions, are passivity. Passivity is based on disagreement. So nobody is going to buy into someone else's preferences, even if those preferences become liked by 1,000 people on Facebook, okay? So not every, not the whole Facebook community will like all the same thing, right? So never thought about f Facebook in these terms, but maybe that's a good way. So um, that means that for every situation in which you have the formation of a dominant group, there will be necessarily some non-aligned individuals that do not buy into that conditioning. Just because not everybody can agree on someone else's preferences. Okay, that's just a consequence of Spinoza's theory of affects. And they do not comply with the dominant affective conditioning. So, okay, everybody's mad at cats. I'm not mad at cats, I don't really care. So, sorry. So, therefore, since they don't comply, they become object of hatred. And not only from the leaders, but also from the whole dominant group, right? Because they become someone, or a group of someones, that do not love the same thing that we all love, right? We are different. And this creates a constant, a constant conflict. Now, the interesting thing is that um, non-aligned individuals will always be present. Right? So they always be there. Whenever there is a dominant group, there will be non-aligned individuals. And they are strong enough to resist the dominant conditioning. Otherwise, they would just conform. But they are not strong enough to overthrow the dominant conditioning. They are in this in-between position where they can survive, but not quite flip the situation. Now, you can think about non-aligned individuals as a minority, but I think minority, it's kind of tricky term that has to do with quantitative, how many you are, and I think that this is not the point. It can be even 50-50. Think about gender issues, right? It doesn't have to be the, the dominant group in terms of the mass part of the people. It's just a, a, a relationship of power. In principle, it could be even the, the minority group I mean, to be the dominant group. It doesn't matter. It depends on the power they have, right? So non-aligned simply means that they do not comply. Not strong enough to survive, not strong enough to overthrow the situation. And I, I'm not assuming that the non-aligned individuals are right in non-complying. That's not the point here for now. And they are necessarily regarded as a potential threat by the dominant group. So there is constantly this hatred play against the others, right? Those that do not comply. So that suggests that the non-aligned individuals are the main group who has a direct interest in making the whole thing more rational because their survival is very precarious. And the only way in which they can survive is to increase the overall agreement within the political body. But increasing the overall agreement within the political body means to build interactions based on agreement in nature with the whole political body, which in turn means to have a more, a more rational political life. So the non-aligned individuals are those individuals whose survival depends on the possibility for the state to become more rational. So they are those who are going to take action and try to change things. The dominant group will just try to remain the dominant group. 
And of course, that's very unstable. And therefore, they will be very pushy and very excessive in all what they will doing. Because they know that what they are doing is just based on passions. And passions are very, I mean, they fluctuate a lot, right? It depends on all kinds of circumstances. They're not stable. So the non-aligned individuals are those who have a direct interest in changing things. And which means just in fostering agreement and minimizing disagreement. And this does not entail that they will comply or surrender to the dominant group. That's not the point. It's not that they try to uniform. They try to become like the dominant group wants them to be. It's just that they will try to make the whole political body more rational, hence more inclusive. Now, this is the general sketch. Let me now present an example, which is my example, based on what Spinoza seems to do in the TTP. I'm not saying that this is what, that Spinoza did this in the TTP because of what I just said. I'm just saying that you can read what Spinoza is doing there, bracketing whatever intention you may have had, and you can use that as an example to illustrate what I just said. Now, the non-aligned individuals have to rely on some common property that can bind them with the dominant group. So there must be some agreement even between the non-aligned individuals and the dominant group. Just because they are part of the same political body, they, they have to have something in common, although it's very much clouded by all this kind of passionate fights that is around in the political scene. And therefore, the first thing that they have to do is to start interacting with the dominant group on the basis of what they share with that group. And then they have to identify some other property that operates as the passionate glue within the dominant group. Remember, the dominant group is kept together by passion conditionings based on ambition and glory. So there is something there that binds the dominant group together, which is a passion, which is some property, but that property is a property of disagreement, is not shared within the old political body. And then, the non-aligned individuals have to make apparent that that glue that binds, to, binds together the dominant group is at odds with this more general shared common property. And that binds together the whole political body. And in this way, they create a kind of fluctuation that undermines that binding glue. So, the example. Let's take the scenario of religious fanaticism, right? Fanaticism for Holy Scripture, whatever. So you take the dominant group to be a group of religious fundamentalists, and there will be non-aligned individuals who do not buy into this religious fundamentalism. Now, what do they, do they share? Well, one thing you could share is the principle that Holy Scripture has to be interpreted it just looking at Holy Scripture, okay? This is something that can be shared, the principle sola scriptura. Now, if you use this principle, of course, the dominant group is bound by love toward Holy Scripture. This is part of, of being a, funda a religious fundamentalist. You really love Holy Scripture. The problem is that you love Holy Scripture because you love it as a means of becoming more powerful. That's the problem. Right? You want to exploit Holy Scripture, which you love, in order to foster your own political power. That's exactly what happens with the preachers, according to Spinoza Preface TTP. So, you look at that bound. That, that's the glue in the dominant group. That mixture of love and ambition and glory. Now, you can show and use Sola Scriptura, that principle, to show that the dominant group betrays Holy Scripture. So if you really love a Holy Scripture, then read it. Read it really carefully, right? Really, really carefully. And you'll see that there is no point in Holy Scripture that you can use to support the use of Holy Scripture for political purposes. So if you really love it, then read it very carefully. And then you'll see and you'll realize that it's impossible to use Holy Scripture to support political power. Now, this strategy is supposed to show and to create the condition for a fluctuation within the dominant group. Because on the one hand, yes, we really stick to all the scripture. That's, that's our leader. That's our common 
uh, the thing in which we trust. But at the same time, we're also doing something else, some, some, something doesn't seem to be right with that, right? So in this way, the kind of instability that is present inevitably in any kind of passionate glue starts to boil, right? Start to uh, develop because then on the one hand you have this love, on the other hand you have this doubt that maybe we're doing something wrong. And of course, maybe that's not the leader who's been doubting that he or she is wrong. But remember, the dominant group is just a bunch of people put together by passions. So it doesn't matter whether the, the leader doesn't doubt. What matters most is whether the others are doubting or not. And they are just imitating some effects. That's all very unstable. You just need to push on the right point. And therefore, to get rid of that fluctuation to that kind of instability, what do you have to do? Well, you can't give up sola scriptura because on the one hand, that's something you love and that's something reinforced by even the non-aligned individuals. So that gets a even greater support because it's supported within the dominant group and within the old state, even by non-aligned individuals. So that, that rational common property gets support from everywhere. So it's relatively stronger. That's what Spinoza says in, in part five of the ethics. Rational ideas are relatively st stronger because they are supported by more causes. So this kind of creates a, a way of putting pressure on the property of disagreement for all sides and maybe use that pressure to disempowering that property of disagreement. Disempowering, in this case, the idea that you have to use, you must use Holy Scripture for political purposes. So, this is just an example. What I think this shows is that, first of all, non-aligned individuals are a kind of corollary of Spinoza's ethical theory. And they can work as an internal antidote against oppression. So they are not something that has to be brought from outside. It's something that wherever there is oppression, there's going to be that kind of individuals there. The other very important thing is that there is no guarantee that is this is going to work. And this is good. It's good that it's not guaranteed, that it depends on fortune, right? Because if it was just a mathematical theorem you can just deduce, then you could not account for failures. So it's very important that the theory does not predict a certain, uh, this is gonna work, trust me, go ahead. No, it can, it can fail because it depends on fortune, it depends on all kinds of circumstances. And maybe it will fail on, on the short run and maybe it will succeed on the long run. Look at the Netherlands. The Netherlands, 500 years after Spinoza, there is not, much theology in the political sphere, at least as far as I can say. There is no preachers who pretend to dominate the political scene, right? That would, would be considered outrageous if that was the case. But that was the case at Spinoza's time, right? So you can see that maybe on Spin in Spinoza's lifetime, things didn't change much. Maybe it got a bit worse, right? But on the long run, you never know. So, and that's, I think, it's a resource that Spinoza's theory has. It's not closed. It's open. It just indicates something you can do. And then it's up to, well, events and fortune to see how and when it will work. So the more general conclusion is that reason comes in degrees, and therefore improvement, at least of some degree, is always possible. Maybe there is a very oppressive society. Maybe you won't get into a perfectly well-organized rational society, but it can become a bit better. And this is what Spinoza studies in the TTP. I mean, the ancient Hebrew state was not ideal, was far from ideal, but was kind of better than just a bunch of people in the desert hanging around, right? So they at least produced a couple of philosophers, Solomon and Christ. Yeah, n not like ancient Greece, but still, right? So, well, if you get Christ, it, I think it kind of bonus comes with it, so it's still kind of good. So, and to increase rationality and resist oppression, 
is vital to find strategies that maximize agreement and minimize disagreement. But here by agreement, I don't mean conformity. I mean building on shared common properties, something objective, something that is really in nature, as we were mentioning yesterday. So this kind of objective ground of common properties is, are things that you can ontologically show are conducive to increase the power of both things interacting at the same time. It's not just imagining that we share something. No, it has to be something in nature. That's why they work. Otherwise, it's just play with imagination. And again, Spinoza is very careful in distinguish these kind of things because, of course, he distinguishes just imagination. We're all free. Freedom is not a common notion. Freedom is just imagination. Or we can all cooperate together to make the state more harmonious. This is a common notion because if you make the state more harmonious, you'll see the effects on your own life. And that's rational. You can demonstrate that. You can't demonstrate that there is freedom. You can demonstrate that there is no freedom freedom of choice, et cetera. And last, the solution to the problem of how one can reach the supreme good has to be a political solution. I think we, we, we go back to what we were saying yesterday. So it has to be political in the sense that without the appropriate social conditioning, the supreme good cannot be reached. Because you're going to be anyway in a certain causal network. You, you never live in a vacuum. You couldn't try. You couldn't. You couldn't breathe, right? So you're, you're embedded in some causal network anyway, so you can't escape from that. So best thing you can do is to try to find ways of making that causal network working for rationality, right? Now that's what I wanted to say. If I have still two minutes, I would do something weird. So I'll just follow my intuitions and try to talk you through them, because I'm not sure how to say this. But So, this is the cover of the book, <laughs> right? So, the cover of the book comes from this. And this is Pellegrino Tibaldi, a piece of the Pellegrino Tibaldi's frescoes in Palazzo Poggi in Bologna. And this is Iolus, the king of winds. Now, when I saw that picture, I didn't even know that that was Hiolo, so that it was Pellegrino Tibaldi. My imagination said, oh, this is a prophet. This is one of the prophets that Spinoza is talking about. So it was complete imagination, inadequate idea. And then I sent that picture to Thomas Colburn, who is a PhD candidate in, in Montreal at McGill, and is also a painter. And I asked him, Thomas, if something resonates with you with this picture, I have this book would you mind do something for the cover? And he said, of course, yes. So he worked on it a bit, and he got there. And then, now that the, the thing is coming out, I asked him, could you give me a caption for, for your own cover? And I'd like to quote what he wrote. So this is Thomas' interpretation of his artwork. So, resting and in motion, a figure comprised of lines, planes, and bodies is arranged and rearranged, embodying particularity and expressing divinity which I found very beautiful. And indeed, I kind of see how he managed to rearrange that figure into that other figure. Now, and yesterday, when, when I was like thinking about saying something about this, my intuition was that something we can also look at in trying to build this kind of agreement, build this kind of rethinking of society, is just take a bit of distance from what we see, from the imagination, which means also from the language we constantly caught in, and try to do something. But this doing something is more like the kind of doing that art does, that maybe doesn't have a particular well-defined goal, doesn't comply with business uh, management skills and, and goals. It's not that kind of doing. It's more like that kind of doing that doesn't necessarily bring about something very particular but helps us to reshape how we, th we see things, right? Because, of course, this is the same thing, but it's not the same thing at all, right? And I was just wanted to, to bring this to attention because, of course, Spinoza was not an artist, but around Spinoza there were artists, and one of his good friends, Ludwig, Ludwig Meyer, was thinking with other Spinoza's friends in the circle, in the Volenti Busardum, how do we use, for instance, 
theater and theatrical action to reshape society and foster this kind of narratives that may make society more rational. Like, and that was the kind of conversation. So how do we make society better? Well, maybe we should look at theater, maybe we should look at paintings, maybe we should look at art. So that's just a vague intuition, rough, but uh, since we are in a museum, I thought maybe that's worth mentioning. And then I also mentioned that, and I don't know, I see some similarities here, but maybe it's just the position of the hands and the <laughs> arms, but uh, I'll, I'll let you judge about this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea. Does anybody have an immediate response? I guess my first thoughts uh, are about uh, short-term versus long-term, yeah. because uh, you're obviously sketching uh, uh, a somewhat, I mean, a, a guardedly optimistic path uh, towards uh, achieving this supreme good uh, that, as you said, you know, we'll look at 500 years ago or 350 years ago in the case of Spinoza and uh, where, how far we've come and we've, we've burst out of theocracy and we're in a some, let's say, transitional mode towards, hopefully towards <laughs> something better. However, uh, um, we, we haven't done away with um, hierarchical governmental forms, productive forms, uh, we're still uh, dependent on them. Uh, so, uh, and we, uh, and in, in nowadays, I guess it's becoming really uh, intoler uh, intolerable to accept the compromise. Uh, maybe, maybe because we're getting closer to our goal or maybe um, uh, because of the other pressures that are coming from the environmental crisis, et cetera and uh, the crisis of capitalism, which seems to be uh, becoming exacerbated. So how do we square that? How do we uh, navigate between this short-term urgency and this long-term uh, striving towards the supreme good? Yeah, so that, that's very interesting. And, and indeed, maybe um, I didn't want to suggest that now we're better than at Spinoza's time, because I think that on several respects, we may be worse than at Spinoza's time. But it was just concerning religious oppression, Seem, that seems to be, at least here in Holland, a bit better. But uh, what I also have in mind is that this kind of conditionings often work at different layers and overlap a lot with one another, and individuals are fuzzy entities with, with very fuzzy boundaries, so you maybe belong to different kind of groups at the same time, and getting into different kind of networks at the same time. So my, su my suggestion is that you should look at particular instances, particular kind of groups and relationships of oppression that may coexist within the same conventionally called state or society, which is actually is a bundle of different kind of problems, societies, networks, and so on. So my suggestion is that for each of these groups and networks, you'll find non-aligned individuals. So in some cases, that will be clear cut and will all just coincide with the same, we would call the same physical person. But maybe in other cases, some people will be part of a dominant group on one respect and part of non-aligned individuals on another respect. So it's very complicated and tricky. So, and my sense is that it doesn't proceed in a linear way. It's, that has been mentioned by Deleuze, I mean that quote by Deleuze where we don't advance in a linear way. I think that's very much also what Spinoza would say. And I would refrain from using Spinoza to make precise predictions, because I think we hang too much on the need for precise predictions, and this is a way of handling fear, which is not helpful, because it's based on fear, so it just reinforces fear. Mm -hmm. So I even now know whether you can get rid of oppression. Indeed, if you cannot get, get rid of passions, and you cannot because of Proposition 4 of the fourth part, to be dogmatic, uh, you cannot get rid of oppression, right? right? So you don't get the supreme good, all, all of it, for, for forever. Yeah. No, you strive toward it. Yeah. And Spinoza said that. So the greatest striving is the one toward the supreme good. So that doesn't mean you cannot enjoy it, but it's, it's never going to be like, ha, now I'm, now I'm there, now I'm safe. Right? It, it's a bit, yeah, unco uncomfortable kind of answer, but I think that's uncomfortable is helpful. 
from a philosophical point of view. Um, thank you. It was just such a clear presentation, and I think it, it does um, crystallise a lot of what was said yesterday as well. Um, my, I sort of have a, I guess, a observation, but also um, then a question. Um, I think you're absolutely right about um, reason being something that's achieved in concert with others, um, and what one. Um, hopes from uh, in a reasonable polity is uh, a harmony of powers um, and you know we spoke yesterday and you signalled too the importance of the TTP as a turning point and then the TP as, as, um, uh, as, as following from the, the you know that the ethics is not achievable without the right kind of political structures institutions and so on <coughs> But the, the observation, I suppose, and then I have a question for you, is um, the necessity for education is, it just seems to be really emerging from our, um, from what everybody has been saying is, is, is very important. Um, and citizenship, which is also important, has to do with adults more than with children. Uh, and it seems that um, you know, you say um, it was humorous, but again, I think, you know, you're right that the Hebrew state uh, produced Jesus, who's above all a teacher, I think. Um, and I just, that does seem to be a bit of a gap in, this, in what Spinoza himself writes, you know, although he signals that education is important, and even he thinks marriage is important, uh, partly because it allows the proper education of children in, in a proper context and so on. But do you, you, know, do you have anything um, to add uh, to, to this? Like, you know, what, should we be, um, okay, we can't predict, we can't, you know, with confidence plan a revolution using spinozistic uh, parameters, but education does seem really important, and I just want, want to draw you a bit more, I suppose, on how you see um, Spinoza's philosophy and the supreme, you know, the achievement of the supreme good. It seems that the education of the passions and attending to how it is we go from infants, who he feels sorry for, right? He, he's, he he's pities the infant because it's... It's just a bundle of passions, yeah? So how, how do we get from that infant to the, to the best citizen, the kind of thing that I think Moans is going to be, you know, focusing on? How, how do we get there? It's, it's really not much yeah. being said there. Yeah, so, um, well, three things. First, Spinoza, as you, as you mentioned, says very little explicitly about this. Although I think that if we take a larger look at education and thinking education as like constant training of the passions, a constant activity throughout life and society, then he says a lot, because all his philosophy is about that. But that's just perspective. And then I would say, well, concerning education in, in this broader sense, well, education is the purpose of the state, right? In the political treatise, it says very explicitly the goal of the state is to make people thrive, not only in their bodies, but also in their minds. How? Well, by understanding what are the most likely passionate conditionings that will affect them, given the kind of political settings in which they're living, and Spinoza is, is aware that if you live in a monarchy, it's different from living in an aristocracy, and then knowing that, you try to balance them insofar as this allows people to develop certain kind of interaction with one another that makes them cooperate in an harmonious way, and then the internal drive for rationality will do the trick. That seems to be the overarching project in the political treatise. That applies, however, to human beings in general. So it doesn't address what you were saying more specifically about, uh, I mean, infants becoming young people and then adults. Now, on that particular problem, I have a kind of crazy thought that I didn't completely develop, but here it is. So my sense is that education works by destroying the overall form of an individual without destroying the components and allowing the components to restructure themselves in a stronger way. 
So from a political point of view, you can think about the transition from different forms of states. Like when you change the constitution, you change the constitution, but not, not necessarily you kill all the people living in a state, right? And my sense is that education works from the outside as to be a passive, coercive kind of thing, because the child will strive to remain a child. That's how I read Spinoza. One may disagree with Spinoza, but I think this is what he says. And, but you can push in the right way to push the child to become something else, to lose that essence of being a child, without destroying the underlying parts and allowing those parts to find a better way of interacting that allows them to grow in power and rationality. So I think that the idea that education has to be just let people free of doing whatever they want, just follow whatever comes up, yeah. it's a bit naive because education has this coercion embedded. And we shouldn't be afraid of coercion because the individual comes out of coercion. This is in the definition of individual. When many bodies are coerced, coercator, mm. to stick around in a certain way, they form an individual. Mm. So I think, but then of course, it, it's very, to be handled very carefully, because of course, coercion, it has to be handled very carefully. But this is like any drug, right? It can save your life or kill you. Right, so, and therefore I think education probably is, is going to be the next huge topic in Spinoza scholarship for the next 20 years because that has not been explored very much because maybe we're looking for the wrong thing. And so maybe we should rethink about how we look at it, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. I, this was really um, fantastic. Um, just first, I'm just struck with a very different gazes that are embodied in the two, in the two <laughs> paintings, Spinoza's gaze, which strikes me as incredibly kind, and uh, which, who's the one in the middle again? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> powerful, yeah. I don't see much love or cheerfulness or joy in that gaze. It no. petrifies me, but um, anyway. <laughs> So I suppose this, 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 this old saying that you know um, you coerce those that you love. Um, so I wonder, you know, and to get back to your to your point about um, about um, about how it's in the interest of the dominant oppressors to reduce sadness. Um, but I wonder, I mean. <laughs> I wonder if you could say a little bit more about this because about this challenge and I appreciate as you say you know there's no guarantee but the really the truly oppressive regimes um, they exterminate the non-aligned group they commit uh, genocide uh, or they they try to cure non-aligned groups through you know, electroshock therapy I uh, used to, to cure uh, homo uh, homosexuality, for instance, or enforced sex reassignment surgery to, ta to turn gay men into women. So <laughs> I wonder if you could speak to, you know, more to the, the possibilities of, 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 of this turn, this, this strive for uh, agreement in yeah. extremely oppressive yeah. regimes. Yeah, I think it's, to use a metaphor, it's, it's like uh, when the body gets sick, right? So when the body gets sick, you have a certain degree of like antibodies in yourself that may help you to get over. And if you're in the appropriate conditions, you have enough rest, enough support, you're quite enough, you can make it through it, right? But for instance, if you try to cure something too late, then it's not going to be enough. Or sometimes, inevitably, we'll <laughs> die at some point because some external cause at some point will be stronger. There is no way around that. So the point is not to make impossible for horrible things to happen, but by being aware that horrible things may all happen, always happen, and they can always be on the point of happening, being very much aware of how to prevent them I think that Spinoza's suggestion is more about prevention than actual cure. So I think that it, in some cases, just the situation went too far. And it, this kind of internal um, resource 
is not strong enough, is not going to be strong enough, as in our own bodies. So sometimes you're not strong enough to go over a sickness. It just happened, we die. So that's why we'll die at some point. So uh, yeah, it's part of the package. But uh, the fact that we do have an internal resource means that we can also think about the external conditions that would like ties in that internal resource and make the prevention more systematic. So if we are aware that there if we are aware and we know how this kind of passionate conditionings work, and they work differently in different kinds of societies, so each society has its own particular way of being conditioned, then we may pay more attention at the signals. Like, instead of starting the cure when we're already about to die, we can start the cure very early on. And of course, I mean, I don't have a clear-cut answer, and I think you don't want to have an answer that, pre that demonstrates that the horrible thing will never happen. I think that should be on the table. Yes, the horrible thing can happen. We can become horrible beings. That's part of the game. Hence, we need to be careful. Hence, we need to be aware, very much aware, because there is a risk, a very big danger that what I think to be a good human being can turn out to be a Nazi, right? So, and that happened, that happens, that will happen. So I think a theory that doesn't take that possibility away is a good theory. And of course, the, the positive side is that you can prevent. You don't have to, to, to go to the dentist your whole life if you brush your teeth every day. Maybe at some point you'll go, but you, know, you can like, delay that moment at least, right? So it's not a perfect solution. I, I'm not sure you can get that out of Spinoza, but I think it, the suggestion is still kind of helpful to some respect. Yeah, thanks a lot for the clarity of your line of argumentation, Andrea. Uh, so I have uh, two, two questions. One is the circumvention of the Conatus doctrine, uh, which uh, struck me uh, that, that you decide for this. Because I think the move in your argumentation to say we have to have an ontological base of common properties, I think, and the striving is not only the striving for the higher good, because that is a problem. The striving for the supreme good is nothing which is guaranteed, nothing which is directly possible. This is kind of um, crossed out through uh, reality proper. So there has to be an ontological kind of uh, base. And this is the Conatus doctrine is so interesting because I think what this, the initial impulse of being is to affirm your affirmative being. It's a cycle, I mean, it's, it's a kind of, um, what you are affirming in affirming your being determined to a certain act in uh, harmony with your essence is not that the essence is any higher or supreme good, the essence is to affirm the potentiality to act, so you have a certain kind of um, cycling argument, which comes with a very anarchistic in, in the meaning of having no higher norm, having no imminent principle. And that is very anomalous for the 17th century, that this kind of supreme, the, I mean, knowledge in and of itself is not anomalous at all to affirm rationality. But to affirm the desire of desire, there is something which is astonishing modern and astonishing vitalist. There is a vitalist ontology. And I'm not agreeing with how, for example, you depict Balibar in your sketch. She's not about the idea, the only like the, the traffic and the uh, um, exchange of ideas. He goes through that cycle of, so within the Conatus doctrine is the, it's, you are able to explain what you explained, the ontological ground of the argument. There have to be either something in common, which is the direct encounter. If, if we encounter in a good way, though we have totally idiotic ideas uh, of our encounter, but it works. I mean, it works, it functions, and for that very short turbulent moment of functioning, we have an increase in our force of existences. 
that is turbulent, that can end up in envy or that I'm okay, she was so nice and not anymore. There are inner, inner lines of corruption, of turbulence, if, uh, as you said, due to the reality of oppressive society. That we, but that leap in the existential force, that is a leap that can catalyze thought, because you need a way how you come into it. It will not be just a speculation on a common good, like sola scriptura. It has to have an ontological ground. And so if we all believe in the Bible, that then is a psychic projection. And this also involves an ontological ground, but you have to go through the Conatus doctrine to explain it. Our projections, imaginations, as silly as they can be, for example, the belief in the Holy Scripture, uh, allows us for a moment to, to jump out of the circle of glory, because in the circle, that, that's what Mataron, also Baliba, I mean, they, also Deleuze, the entire French reading is using this, how do you come out of the cycle of ambition? And you come out of the cycle of ambition because narcissism is fine for Spinoza. It's not that we have morally to attack. Uh, you are an idiot. You are an imaginary narcissist. You have, through the uplifting experience of recognition of love of love, I'm doing something because I assume you, who are, I'm assumed to be similar to me, uh, I assume you like it, and I'm doing what you like because I want to be liked, and through that circle of love for love, I have a re the increase in capacity is real, it's ontologically real, and that makes a ground for a leap into thought, because I, ca I cannot come into thought through just wanting stories. There is no internal tendency to the increase of rationality without this turbulent and unexpected assistance of passions and of projections. So in that way, it's optimist. It's, on a, it's an early, early vitalism that is optimist. And on the other hand, it's very, very pessimist because we know that we can infinitely kind of circle in love for love, and then envy, and then hatred, and then destruction. So, uh, and so that's about how do we come through the ontological experience of projective love, or of real common properties, there are two ways, into thought, and how can that then be politically grasped? I, I was so astonished that you kind of uh, circumvent the Conatos doctrine, which seems to me very at the core of, of, of your argument. The second question, I skip it. Already <laughs> spoke too long. <laughs> very good. <laughs> yeah, please take that microphone. Eventually move to the... Yes, so thank you very much for bringing up the Conatos. So indeed, I circumvented for the sake of presentation because I didn't want to get into the uh, details, but uh, to put you the details just very briefly, um, of course, the old theory hinges upon the Canatus Doctrine. Passions are an expression of transitions of power, so you cannot un understand the passions if you do not understand the Canatus. So what I've been doing is taking for granted the Canatus because we are among Spinozists, so everybody has a bit of Canatus here. So um, I take that for granted that I didn't elaborate on that in that sense. But you're completely right, and I think you explained that already, so I wouldn't reiterate that. I just say, yeah, the, the, my contribution to this is that, yes, there is this canatus, yes, there is power, but how does this work exactly in a way that is empowering, genuinely? Well, my sense is that just increasing the quantitative amount of power won't do the trick. Because you, you can have a very, very powerful passion of joy, and that's still a passion. It's still inadequate. It's still far from the supreme good. Indeed, Spinoza says, extreme passions of joy can become madness. Extreme love, madness, right? So what you need on top of empowering is a qualitative shift. So it's not just, so, and no, I don't think it's a leap into thought. I think it's a qualitative shift in the kind of causal interaction you have with others. And that's the story about agreement and disagreement. So I think the difference between agreement and disagreement is a qualitative difference, is a different way of interacting that helps you to use the power to maximize what is really empowering. 
right? And concerning the leap into thought, well, I would use more of the mind-body identity theory about this. So the power of the body is the power of thinking. It's the same thing. You cannot use the power of the body and then develop the power of thinking because you think in a certain adequate way insofar as your body is acting as an adequate cause to a certain degree. So that's, I mean, Spinoza says this, even if I think he didn't have the Conatus Doctrine in his mind in the TTP, but he had this intuition in the TTP when he says, well, in order to think, you need to live in uh, security and with good health, right? Which is very, very commonsensical. Like, yes, I mean, even Aristotle would say, well, first try to have a full stomach and then go, go to do philosophy, right? So because other, other way around doesn't work. Right? And this is, I think, a very simple way of putting it. So by how do you increase your power of thinking? Well, by increasing your power of acting overall. And the power of thinking is just a facet of that. Right? So in that sense, because otherwise the risk is to make it like I do something in the domain of the body and I will get the result in the domain of the mind, which in a sense you may say, but it's also tricky in the formulation because you don't want to have a causal connections, right? So I think you can also just address one level, the material conditions, and that will result in the development of the mental level. And concerning ambition, just, just a very small footnote. Um, in the political treaties, I think there is no way out of ambition. The, the idea is not getting rid of ambition, it's just to exploit ambition in the right way. So if you, especially if you live in a monarchy, you need ambition. You need to build on ambition in order to make sure that the Supreme Council, which is the dam against the power of despotency and, and, and tyranny, will remain there. Because if everybody has the ambition to get in the Supreme Council, they will protect the Supreme Council. And therefore, the king will not become just a tyrant. Right? So in that sense, in certain circumstances, you do need to keep ambition well and thriving, right? so, which is interesting for us. Because you may say, well, at some point you get rid of some passion. Oh, no, 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 no. For Spinoza, depending on where you live, sometimes you, you need to use them. But thanks for, for the comments. Two, two questions for you, and, and well, I think, well, I guess, I don't know. Does this work? Yeah. Um, okay, so the, the, the first thing is, 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 is sort of a question, but also, I guess, as a little bit of a criticism, which is about, uh, there's a sort of vacillation in what you say, and when you sometimes you say oppressive societies, and sometimes you say an oppressive state, which is not the same thing. Uh, I mean, in, in Spinoza, there is this basic political distinction between society and the state embedded in the difference between the res publica and the imperium, on the other hand. And, and, and as far as I can see, the presentation that you were making was mostly about the oppressive society or pr oppressive uh, res publica, so it's citizen oppressing other citizens, um, which has a bearing on what is the cure for this, because one of the cures, we talked about it as a pharmacon, huh? the, the education, but the biggest cure of all here, the biggest pharmacon here is the state. Huh? The state is what will save us, it is also what may kill us if the rulers are violent. So I think maybe you could get, gain some precision in what you say. I don't think I disagree with anything you say, but I think you can gain precision in what you say if you constantly navigate between uh, correctly between state and society, between res publica and imperium. So, so that was more the comment. The, the other one is, is a real question for you, which is, I think is a difficult one, which comes back to what you said in the beginning about the epistemic self-sufficiency of the mind that you had detected in the early writings. And how much, my question is, how much of that is carried over into the later writings. Now, this question comes out of a particular discussion that we had some months ago when we, were, we had a, 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 a session in, in Paris about the book that Samuel Newlands just wrote, Reconceiving Spinoza, uh, where there's a long chapter on Spinoza's moral epistemology, where he's making the argument that Spinoza's conception of how uh, society helps you uh, let's say, attain the supreme good, it's not just about yourself gaining knowledge or getting joy out of getting your own knowledge, but it's also about you getting the joy out of communicating that knowledge to others. 
so that you not just get joy out of knowledge, out of self-knowledge and out of, 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 of the knowledge that you gain of, of others, but also you get joy out of making others also acknowledge stuff. Huh? So, and I, I think of this because you used the exact same example with a disagreement with your neighbor. Huh? So, what is the supreme good for, for, for Spinoza in the later text? Is it, you have a disagreement with your neighbor, if you are really understand what was, say, why it is that your neighbor has acted in the way that he did so that you get angry, you get joy or peace of mind from the fact that you understand why he did that. But in order to attain real peace of mind, do you also need him to understand why he did it? So that's my question here. In the later, is there still an element of this epistemic self-sufficient of the mind, so it's just your own knowledge that, that counts for the joy? Or does the other guy's knowledge of, uh, also count? Yeah, thanks very much. So I, I completely agree about the first point, the vacillation. So what you, indeed, the presentation about the private societies and what you call state, I call political body. So uh, that would be my main terminology. And I would say that the oppressive dominant group is within the society and the oppressive dominant group plus the non-aligned individuals, they form together the political body. And the disease of the political body is the disagreement between these two components that are there, but they're not agreeing enough to make the whole thing working properly because one part wants to get rid of another part. Yeah. And, and that's the conflict. And of course, yes, the health of the whole political body is the solution. And the point is whether there are, since in, at the political level Spinoza doesn't believe much into external interventions that will make things better, he wouldn't believe the EU will make Italy better. Uh, so uh, maybe, who knows? Uh, <laughs> uh, but, so it's important to look whether there are internal resources, right? And so I was looking within the political body how that can happen. So, but I basically we agree on, on this. So, thanks. Concerning the epistemic self-sufficiency, so um, what I so I'll tell you what I think, and then maybe I, I don't know what what, what uh, the other book is saying. So I, I won't comment much on that. But my sense is that in the in, in the treatise on the emanation of the intellect, Spinoza of course says by communicating knowledge, by making others understanding the good, I'm much happier. It's, it's much cooler if everybody knows God. It's so, so nice. But if, if this doesn't happen, yeah, yeah, doesn't happen. It doesn't matter. It's not a necessary condition for the supreme good to obtain because the supreme good is communicable by itself. And if others would be necessary condition for the supreme good to occur in my mind, then the supreme good would not be communicable by itself. So. And we can go more into the details about that, but if you see how Spinoza described the supreme good and the conditions for the supreme good to obtain in the treatise on demandation, it's very clear that the supreme good is something that does not depend on anything else except the in innate power of the human mind itself. So of course, it's much better, it's much easier, everything is smoother if others go along, but if they don't, you can still get there. So, the supreme good is not the fact that others understand, is not the fact that others are happy. The supreme good is consistently described as the knowledge of the idea of God. Nothing below. If you have the most beautiful, nicer society on earth where nobody cares for the knowledge of God, they do not reach the supreme good because the supreme good is that idea. Now, the point becomes, what are the conditions for getting the knowledge of God in the ethics? Well, the conditions is that you need reason. How do you get reason? You need knowledge of some common properties. For instance, it's enough to have the knowledge of the property of extension or thought, that's enough. How do you get there? Well, you need to interact with someone, somebody, to get the idea of the property of extension. That's the minimum. Of course, if you're clouded by all sorts of passions that disturb you from meditating on the supreme good, and Spinoza uses this term deliberately, meditating with a constant mind, in a letter in, that he writes in the 60s. So, of course, you cannot attend to that idea, and you have all kinds of other ideas in your mind. You think, oh, what are, are they commenting on Facebook on my account? Of course, you're not paying attention to what you already have in your mind, therefore you do not enjoy 
the supreme good. And in the, in the later writings, it becomes very clear that it's impossible to enjoy the supreme good if the society around you does not reach a sufficient level, level of rationality because you don't get common notions just by yourself. They are common because they arise from interaction with someone else. And even if they are there, you may not notice them because the disagreement part may be enforced and empowered by external causes that are infinitely more powerful than yourself. So you don't have control over that. So that's why the external conditions become necessary. But it's not necessary that the other understand the supreme good. Indeed, Spinoza is very, is very explicit about that in the political treatise. He says, well, it would be very good if the rulers would be perfectly rational, but the good state is a state in which, whether, independently of whether you're rational or not, you're good or bad, you're clever or stupid, you'll act in a way that will make the whole state peaceful and harmonious. So it's completely irrelevant whether the others, individually, one by one, reach the supreme good. What matters is the, let's say, cooperation, the global form of interaction you get. And of course, there will be people that will not get the supreme good, but still may be conditioned in such a way to help the overall interaction to go along in a certain way. So I don't, I, when, when I mentioned the example of the neighbor, was only to point out the external conditions that can affect the mind to think in a certain direction or another. It's irrelevant whether the neighbor reaches the supreme good. Of course it's better, because it's even a stronger form of agreement, mm -hmm. right? But, uh, and it's necessary that we go along in a certain minimal way, decent way of rationality with my neighbor. But whether the neighbor reaches the supreme good, I mean, it otherwise it becomes impossible to reach the supreme good. And Spinoza is very much aware of this. And I think the political treatise is a wonderful example where he's very aware of this. So I guess it's nearly time to go, but um, maybe I can just uh, close with some remarks again about education or some questions to you. Um, and thanks for the paper. I really, really enjoyed it and got a lot out of it. Um, so coming back to this question of education, it, it occurs to me that, of course, the Latin ed educare is about drawing out. And I wonder whether there's a kind of a, a foundation in Spinoza of thinking of education as drawing out in the child common properties that we all have. Um, because... The other thing that occurs to me about children is that because they're a bundle of passions, I mean, children can be among the most hateful individuals <laughs> to each other in our society that there are, and children form hatreds of other groups of children on the basis of categories that are entirely arbitrary, generally, um, and sometimes those arbitrary categories are based in the kinds of categories that are in the society at large, so of course they can be based on gender and race and, and, and these other problematic ca categories. Um, but I suppose that the, th the thought is that if we allow children to just find their own commonalities on the basis of passions and imagination, they're going to find commonalities that are imaginary and that, that can have the potential to be hateful and to, to cause disagreement or to increase disagreement in society. So I suppose the role of adults is to, to educate children in the sense of literally drawing out those common capacities, those common powers, uh, common uh, properties, which are perhaps hidden, which are essential. Um, so I guess it occurs to me that things like, you know, requiring children to do sports or to do sort of physical education is actually a good thing on Spinoza's uh, lights because, uh, you know, by doing that we, we increase our, our adequate knowledge of physical bodies and how they move and, and of course one could think of lots of other kinds of examples that would draw out common properties in the mind. So I suppose, I suppose one question um, if, you know, if you agree with this broad model is, well what does that require of us as adults? So how, how do we as, as adults educate our children in that sense of drawing out? Um, it, do you think it's necessary that we already have that sort of level of wisdom and that level of common property? Do we already need to know what those things are in order to draw them out in our children? Or, or can, we, you know, uh, can we teach them without already having that? Well, well, that's a wonderful question. I think that would be one of the questions on the table for next 20 years of Spinoza research. It's wonderful. Well, I mean, if I have to take my, my reading of common notions seriously, not sure I have to take it, but let's assume for a while, uh, then, well, if you act, interact with the child in a rational way, that's how you draw out common notions. So it's, it's not that you know the common notions beforehand, and then you use them to interact with the child. But 
the moment you find the rational way of interacting with a child based on agreement, because you do agree with the child on some things, and you enforce that and you, you foster that kind of interaction, that kind of interaction leads both of you to build on common notions, right? That, that's, that's the idea of agreement. That agreement is a rela relational property that is shared by both parties. And therefore, whoever is acting on that can be done also by the other. That, that's the whole point of, of stressing agreement that does not depend on just one, right? So probably you can't have, or maybe at this point I wouldn't be able to list a number of concrete practices that you need to cultivate, but whatever, but maybe it's good that I don't have a list a priori, but whatever you do with a child that allows this mutual agreement, despite all the differences, the huge differences that on Spinoza's account there are, well, that's based on proper common notions, which th they are proper in the sense that they express a high degree of agreement. You're not just interacting with a child as you're interacting with a body in general, pushing or pulling. That, that's a universal common property that is not going to help much, right? But wh whenever you interact based on some proper common notions, like may even be like mutual interest, mutual sharing, mutual experiences that you share. I mean, I've been educating, having lunches and di no, dinner mostly, watching TV, right? Is this a way that is going to develop any proper common notions? I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> At some point, I gave up TV because I realized that, oh, it's not going to help, right? So whatever. But you, basically, you don't have to draw them out knowing them beforehand. It's by, by doing, by doing the thing that you know. Can I, can I just, yeah. Um, so maybe you already answered my, my question in your answer to uh, Professor Lerger. But uh, there seems, seems to be a, a kind of um, an implicit assumption in, in your talk where you talk about oppressed society where the oppressed are oppressed in, an, in a kind of uh, unjustifiable way because the truth is on the side of the oppressed. But what if, in a modern democracy like ours, it is the case where the, it might be the case, that the, the oppressed do not have the truth on their side, right? Um, but yet, it's a democracy, so they have the voice, they can use everything they, um, they are allowed to use in a democracy. Would that be uh, enough for Spinoza, from a Spinoza point of view? Um, would, would there be a justifiably uh, oppressing strategy in a democracy towards the oppressed that seem to have the truth not on their side? Yeah, that's a very good question, actually. And I would say that oppression doesn't have to do with truth, but with passionate conditionings. So my sense is that oppression is a way in which passions structure themselves. So it's not necessarily based on truth. Actually, if it's based on passions, it cannot be based, based on truth, right? So probably we need some more careful distinction between what we could call oppression in Spinozistic terms, which is a passionate conditionings happening in society. I would say it's been simplistic. It's a psychological kind of phenomenon in the sense Spinoza would understand in the third part of the ethics from other forms of paternalism or, or strong Republican interventions on society, which is something that Spinoza is completely okay with because the old political treatise is an exercise in paternalism. I mean, that, that's the thing. I mean, how do you read whether he, he thought to implement it directly or just to use that as a speculum to look at real things and just disagree with what is going? That's another issue. But the whole, poli all, the whole idea of, of, of the political treatise is basically enforcing paternalism all the way down. So, but that's different because that's done from the sy systemic point of stabilizing a system in a way that can generate rationality. Now, the kind of oppression I, I was thinking about is more psychological in the sense it's rooted in just 
passionate conditionings like hatred for some certain groups or desire for glory for some certain of attitude is more like what we saw yesterday in, in the viewer example, like let's everybody exercise at least one day a week because they really like that, so I want to do that. And so everybody has to do the same because then I'll, I'll have a reinforcement of what I already love. So that's the kind of oppression I was talking about. Um, I think we need to, to break now for, for lunch, unless uh, you want to. <laughs> if you work in practice, especially in the field of uh, conflict transformation in a lot of these oppressive states, I would say that uh, neither reason nor education or civic education will contribute a lot to obtain that. Because I think what is most important is also not the masses, but how do you transform the secret service and the military? And sometimes it's even in their constitutions written down. And how can you transform these in order to do that? Because in the other ones, I think we are very naive. Yeah. And I think it's not for glory or other things, but mostly because of money. If you see, let's say, all the mining, the diamonds, the money they get, it's not for the glory and, or how they will appear in the historical books, but it's for their money. I think we are very naive. Spinoza has many things to say about money. Beth wrote about that, so uh, I won't comment more. But you, I, I, I sympathize. Yes, yes, it's a good point. Okay, we, well, we will go on. We will fortify ourselves to uh, go on uh, 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 exploring common notions together. First, uh, please, uh, let's uh, uh, congratulate uh, Andrea San Giacomo. <laughs> And the whole panel who listened very carefully. <laughs>